Welcome back to Data Driven Leadership. I'm your host, Jess Carter. On today's episode, we're talking to Jorge Sancha, co founder and CEO of Tiny Bird. Let's get into it. Jorge, welcome. Thank you. Uh, great to be here, Jess. Awesome. How's your day going? Uh, great. Um, a bit jet lagged because uh, I'm in Madrid today, flying from uh, the US uh, just a day ago or so. Um, so, uh, but other than that, um, never been better. I mean, not cool for the jet lag, but it's cool that you're in Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is my hometown, so uh, we have a, um, a team here. So uh, I'm uh, I'm here for for work and to see some prospects as well. So always exciting to come back. Awesome, very cool. Um, I've been to 26 countries, but I've never been to Madrid and so um, Spain. And so I'll have to pick your brain on where to go and put that on the list. You should uh, stick around for some tips after we're done. Okay, okay, <laughs> happy to. I would love that. This is a this is a perk of podcast hosting. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and now Jorge, you run. So you you are this co-founder of Tiny Bird, and I wanted to ask you to kind of get into. You know, what is that and how did you get there? And I think we're going to sort of um, land at a conversation I want to have around data warehousing so in, just kind of in mm -hmm. general. So will you unpack what is Tiny Bird and how did you become a co-founder of this cool company? Sure. Um, so uh, Tiny Bird is um, a real-time data platform. It helps developers to build uh, over large amounts of data um, with very low latency and very high concurrency. Uh, just using SQL and Git. So uh, it basically using the tools that developers already know how to use. The way we started was because we realized that first data was growing at an incredible uh, pace. And a lot of the data warehousing technology was not meant to build applications uh, um, on top of it. And... Um, we saw in all the companies that we were talking to, also in the company that uh, all of our, the co-founders of the company were working at, that people would throw cathedrals of infrastructure at this problem. They would, um, you know, you have technology to capture the data, you have technology to store the data uh, for a, an amount of time or forever. Then you have um, pipelines to move the data from one place to another one. Then you'll need low latency stores to build applications and then you'll need to build a backend. And, and that's essentially a very, um, conceptually, it should be a very pro easy problem to solve, which is you have data, you want to query it and expose it somewhere in an application. And that's what we set out to, to solve, which is we want to make it easy. And I want to make it easy for data teams, but also for engineers and for data teams to enable other engineers to build uh, on top of that data, on top of large amounts of data in the same way that they build on top of small amounts of data. So that, that, that was how we uh, went for it, basically, and what we were trying to solve. If I try to step back and look at, you know, this sort of really interesting problem and solution you've created... I mean, some of the questions I have, and I've been in um, like state government for a while. And so a lot of that kind of notoriously is known for being maybe a decade behind the private sector. Um, and so, yeah, we're like, we're still, hey, you should have a warehouse most of the time. We're like, that's a good idea um, is let's put your sources together and look at what we can learn about your your whole customer, the full picture of somebody who's on unemployment, now seeking reemployment or somebody who's in the Bureau of Motor Vehicles trying to get a license. Um, and so one of the questions I have for you is how do you explain you know, um, how do you explain the need for this kind of product to somebody who is maybe just learning the value proposition of a warehouse? Hey, it's not just my applications, it's the data within them, but then you have metadata. And so is there a simple way you found to kind of explain the value proposition here? How we explain what we do is something we are constantly uh, grappling with, as you can imagine, because depending on who you're talking to and where they are in the data maturity curve, let's say, uh, they either get it immediately or, you know, you have to paint a picture that, uh, that, that um, they can clearly understand in the way that they have been conditioned to understand data or data warehousing and so on. So um, one of the, I mean, one of the things... The, um, it's important to understand uh, is when I basically start from scratch, I start talking about, you know, transactional databases like Postgres or MySQL. They're great to keep track of state. What's happening with my shopping cart? What's happening with my order? Um, 
and then those databases are great at you know updating individual records and reading just a bunch of records. Then you have analytical databases. Those are the data warehouse that they're interested in the history of those states. You can track the history of what's happened. So not just you know how many orders you've had, but how long do they stay between uh, you know purchased and shipped? You know on average and. You know, that, that is what data warehouses allow you to do is understand your business much better and what's happening and where could be, um, what could you do to improve uh, on your business and uh, whether you're getting better or not at it. Um, that's the best reason to get a data warehouse, which is, you know, it's not just about delivering on, on your promise, it's about getting better at it every day and, and it's important to look at the data if that's what you want to do. And then finally... What once you're able to collect that data and you can uh, generate insights out of it, you'll want to automate a lot of those insights and what to do about them. And you'll want to build other things on top of that data. You'll want to show your customers um, all that information and give them a better understanding of how they benefit from your product. And you'll also want to release new features based on, the, um, on that data. And that's where real time becomes really important. And, and, that, and it can be a great competitive advantage. Um, you know, the value of data decreases over time. So the sooner you can leverage those insights, the sooner you can do something about those insights, um, the more benefit that you're going to get out of it, the more you can iterate about over those insights. And uh, we've seen that um, over and over now, over, we're, this, we're in a fifth year now, but we've had enough time to see how when a company starts working in real time, it, it is mind shifting. It's in the sense of, hey, if I can do these, I didn't realize we could do this in real time, and this is changing how I operate my business. I can now automate certain things. I can now, um, uh, you know, have a better sense of what's going on in real time. I can react to problems and opportunities much faster. Uh, and then it basically triggers um, a lot of, hey, what else can I do in real time? But it also triggers the competition as well because it is such a competitive advantage. We, also, we always say speed wins in this company. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, being able to make decisions faster, use less infrastructure, faster queries, all of those things. That's amazing. Does that make sense? Okay. It does make sense. I, I mean, I was going to ask you too for, do you have like a one or two really clear examples where you kind of met a client and they had maybe the analytics, they had, of course, their transactional, but then they kind of added this on top and what it yielded? Yeah. So we... we I'm going to give you three different examples uh, of three different, completely three completely different use cases. Um, the first one was with a big uh, retailer, the biggest fast fashion retailer in the world, who was, um, you know, they're very very competitive and very uh, conscious about the value of moving fast and and. Uh, and there's huge competition and there's very low margins. So selling more faster is very important. And when we um, met them, they had about a, an hour latency from the moment that a transaction took place somewhere in the world in their e-commerce until, until it was visible in their reports. And we helped them brought, bring that down to seconds. Uh, so very near real time. And also because TinyBird is very easy to build new use cases, it's only based on SQL. So once you have the data in there, just creating SQL, just with SQL, you can create APIs that you can integrate in your product and they're very low latency, ready to scale. Um, so they started adding more and more use cases. And then they went from about 60 internal users to over a thousand internal users of this application. And now all their decisions about their business, it's based on real-time data. It's not based on what happened yesterday or what happened an hour ago. It's based on what's happening right now. And that's more or less important for human decisions. Like some decisions doesn't really make a difference if it's right now or an hour ago. Um, but the compounding effect of first, everyone 
making decisions with real-time data. And second, the fact that now some of those things, some of those decisions they can automate because you can have a process that is listening to what's happening in real time and triggering other actions downstream and if and observing the result of those actions immediately. Like if you have a marketing campaign and it's not working as fast as, as you want or as well as you want it to be and you make a change to the price and so on, you're going to see immediately what's the impact of that. Imagine during Black Friday, for instance, huge volume. So the difference of getting it right or wrong can be very important. So that was, that was a great use case for us. And it was one of our first use cases as well. And one of our sort of uh, the, the first customer that sort of validated this, I guess, a huge potential uh, market and opportunity for us. Um, and then we've repeated the same kinds of things in different industries. Another one, um, we work with a company called FanDuel, who's the sports betting uh, uh, application and, and company, which they're an amazing technical team. And, uh, and they've made a big bet in real time. And we help them um, uh, solve a number of use cases around personalization and what happens when you get to the app and what happens when you... Uh, uh, you know, and, and that is, um, really interesting in the context of understanding that, you know, going back to what I was saying at the beginning, that data warehouses allow you to understand your business over time. Analytics has been traditionally used to understand the past, but real time analytics can be used to affect the present of the user experience. Um, and that's another huge opportunity as well. It's, uh, uh, affecting the user experience based on not just what he's experiencing, but what are the other users of the site experiencing as well? What could be interesting uh, for them, uh, you know, mixing different sources of data. So that's another great example of, of real-time analytics as well. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I can go on, but I think that those are a couple of good, uh, yeah, good examples. Yeah, this is awesome. Well, and so, okay, I have so many questions already just based on those examples. So like one of my questions for curiosity is I'm going to imagine that most of your clients aren't going from a different real-time platform to yours. They're going from not having real-time data to having it. Are, are you, can you speak to what that journey is like for a customer? I mean, is that, is it an awkward dance? Is it beautiful? Do you have some coaching or advice you give them? What, what does it look like? It's beautiful as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, actually we, we, one of the um, things we always say is that, you know, speed and scalability and security are super important, but they're table stakes. Uh, of course, you need speed, security, and scalability, of course. Uh, but we are um, betting very big on developer experience is what is your experience and how fast can you build? Can you turn data into revenue? You know, uh, that's, that's really what we're aiming for. So it's very, very easy to, uh, when you sign up to, I mean, we obviously have like a self-service, but we also have dedicated infrastructure. We have for enterprise and we have all uh, kinds of uh, setups, as you can imagine, depending on, on, on type of customer and what the customer wants and the type of the size of the project. But essentially with Tinybird, you, uh, there's no infrastructure to manage. So you just sign up and immediately you create a workspace. A workspace underneath has its own database that you didn't have to set up, and then you can, for instance, if you're using Kafka to capture your data, you can simply connect to Kafka. The, it'll start ingesting right away, and you can start writing SQL right away with a few clicks, and then turn the result of those queries into APIs that you can immediately integrate without having to worry about the scale or anything like that. So that's so it's very easy to get at least one thing done or or a POC done if you want to say okay. I have this stream of data here. Maybe it's Kafka. Maybe it's events you want to send to us directly. Maybe you're using something like um, Confluent or Red Panda or some other provider. Or maybe you have data in your data warehouse that, on top of, that you want to build, uh, on top of which you want to build APIs. Uh, we can also bring data from batch type of sources and sort of run a query and bring it into Tidybird. So you can then build APIs that are very low latency and that can scale. So, you know, it's a very easy way to start. And normally what we recommend uh, with um, uh, customers is to start with a 
one problem, let's solve one problem together and then move on from that because it, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, and, uh, and then it, it's not always a new thing. Sometimes it is a new thing. Sometimes they don't have a real time database. We also see like real time databases. There's a few out there. They all have their good things and their bad things, but they are notoriously hard to scale and manage or manage at scale. So we've also gotten customers that were already using a real time database and were struggling or didn't want to invest in infrastructure um, teams. They wanted to invest in developers and they wanted to invest in going faster rather than in managing infrastructure. So th that's another uh, example of we've also helped companies to migrate from some other real time database to Tinybird. Okay. So then and it really does seem like a a niche for you guys is if, if a uh, industry or area ca you know, speed matters. Speed is going to be where in the same, I, I liked your example about marketing because I think in a lot of times it's like you're running campaigns and it could take one month, six months, a year to really understand the value. But if you can introduce cycles that are near real time where we can make adjustments and incrementally see the change that's coming from the decisions we're making, or A/B testing it as well, like different different promotions for different people, or segment your users in real time. Um, another cool example, for instance, is in gaming. Uh, so gaming, they have some companies like millions of players playing at the same time, and you want to if you I don't know if you play any mobile phone games type of uh, of games. But uh, if, my husband you, does. <laughs> <laughs> you'll know that in the middle of the of like when you finish a level, you get offered things like buy this, um, you know, box of uh, gold coins or whatever at a particular promotion. That promotion is not the same for everybody. It depends on what's your level. It depends on your profile in terms of characteristics, like whether you're a male or a female, or you know, it's based on a number of things, and that segmentation. One problem we've seen in, in, in gaming companies is that segmenting those users with data warehousing technology like Snowflake or BigQuery and so on is not fast enough. Like maybe you can do it every 15 minutes or every hour, but you, and, and what happens is that they end up offering to the player the wrong marketing promotion because if you've been playing constantly, you'll be 10 levels um, further the next, you know, when you're uh, uh, offered that promotion and it's already dated. So uh, so that's another really interesting uh, use case, which is, hey, I want to try different things with different segments of users and see which one performs better. So now with technology like Tinybird, you can do that really, really quickly and then um, constantly improve. Okay, that is super cool. When it comes to building some of your data maturity, because some of this is, it's neat that the product exists. And it's neat that it's available. But what's interesting to me, Jorge, is there's an intersection of of buyers slash users that are either extremely business oriented leaders of businesses who want a different outcome faster and highly technical CDO CIOs who appreciate what needs to work. This isn't more infrastructure. You do need developers as a separate team. And so when you're um, watching customers or um, you know people start to get their arms around this product and, and understand the sense of real-time data, are you watching that combo where it is very much business-led or is it more technology-led? What, what are you noticing? That's a great question. Um, you know, today someone said to me, uh, um, the business side of any company um, it's insatiable. Like they'll always want more faster. And if you give them faster, they'll want it faster and more things and so on. And that is, that's the interesting thing is that that grows or that those needs and that competitiveness, that sense of speed grows as fast as data grows. So there is this double pressure to, um, Hey, you have more data, so you need to be better at solving the problems, but you also need to deliver more. And there's this huge cost pressure right now, the way that sort of an economic situation is. So the, the, 
need to do more with less, it's becoming uh, uh, increasingly uh, more relevant. And so we see two different things. One is um, uh, pressure from above either to go faster or, um, uh, you know, and not hire more people or reduce costs, which you can look at it however you want. Uh, and then we also see that, that that's a good reason why companies start looking into real-time uh, analytics because and, and, and technology like Tinybird because there's only so much you can do with data warehousing technology and maybe you can hire more people to go faster, but that goes against some of these things that we're talking about. So that's one, one type of sort of a, a pressure. The other thing is... Um, wrong tool for the job is we have this thing we want to do. We don't think we're using the right technology. Like for instance, the gaming use case, we need to segment users faster and we're hitting diminishing returns with the current technology. And, and that's more a technology driven search as opposed to a uh, business driven search. Okay. Um, so you see both. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I think, um, the, the, the difficulty to sell for a company like ours is that people will always first try to use the tool that they have and they'll just hammer at it, even if it's not the right tool, you know, and the, def and the <laughs> solutions will be defended for months until someone just says, you know what, uh, you know, and um, so it really depends. Like some companies are very, very, uh, speed and opportunity minded and they'll be happily try something if it feels that it's going to go faster and um, some others it's really difficult to get them to commit to trying something new and so on so so it's, it's a balance i prefer it when it comes from the technology because it's a clear pain a technologist has already identified and then you know you might be or not the right tool but they're looking for something and you can try to figure out with them um, that's also because I come from product and technology. I don't come from sales, but ideally both things collide, you know, like someone in technology really under pressure to deliver on some use case that is not, they're not the right tool for the job and at the same time under pressure to do it fast and, and, and so on. So, right. It's a, it's a clearer scope usually I would imagine where a technologist really understands what, what this might be and they can chase it down with a little more sense of data literacy and maturity of what, what to expect. I think a lot of business users will just say, why can't we just do it faster? And then you're under this pressure of who, who's the guy or gal that says Snowflake can't. Nobody wants to be that person. No one wants to say that. And so and, and it's because you can make those solutions work for a variety of things. But I think your your comment on when are we experiencing as a business diminishing returns? When are we trying? I mean, I have been on a couple of projects where we were working our butts off, right? 18 hour days for 64 days straight, trying to make something happen. And the painful exercise of stopping to say, okay, this is a 17 trial and it didn't work. And what did we learn the 17th time? But at some point making the decision to, to you know, sort of kill the sunk cost and pivot to a new approach, try a new trial, maybe it's a new technology, um, but that requires some serious leadership and somebody who really understands when we need to be at our wits end and, and stop the chaos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a process. And, uh, you know, um, one of the internal metaphors that I use a lot when explaining what we're trying to do and, and how to get into companies and so on, it's, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen how they, how, um, big rocks get split in two, uh, you know, you, you get like a little nail, like a nail and you start putting nails, you know, across the line and then you hit every nail and nothing happens. And, you know, literally you can see certain cracks and eventually it opens up. So, you know, uh, it needs to have, you know, you need to be pounding on that door and explaining the benefits. And then on the other side, the same thing needs to be happening. They need to be hitting their head against the wall Again, some problem, and then you know when you're hitting all of those things, eventually, uh, you know, uh, companies open up and try new things, and and that's how we get into yeah. into opportunities and so. Uh, on. It's an awesome analogy. <laughs> 
Um, the, there's pain and grunt work and a whole bunch tied into the analogy and in the real experience. So I appreciate exactly. that. Exactly. Um, well, okay. So then I'm not, um, I'm not the, I'm not the data engineer myself here, but I've been around them enough. So let me play this through and have you correct me with where I'm wrong. So you kind of said, Hey, the experience would be that you'd sign up, you get access, you, you kind of get your ingestion moving where as soon as there's data that we can access, now we can start playing with the normal tools with Git and et cetera, and kind of start to do our analysis with SQL. Is that right? So the experience really is get the, get access and then the ingestion really starts rolling the real what we can do with our real time data so it, so i'm assuming um one of my questions about ingestion is 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 there are we automating kind of continual ingestion what does it look like with real time ingestion from the moment the data gets generated until you can use it for something the latency of that whole process needs to be very short so um if you think about how traditionally, you know, at the beginning when I was talking about this cathedral of infrastructure, one of the problems with that, even if it's a perfectly valid setup and, uh, and you're great at using those tools, is the handoffs between each component. It, every handoff adds latency, especially if you need to do pre-aggregations or, or massaging the data to leave it in a particular state so that you can use it. So that gets you further and further from real time every step of the way. So um, in the case of Tiny Bird, you're if you, normally for um, real time, you have some type of streaming data. It could be events from a website or it could be um, topics that you're using in Kafka to connect different microservices in an in a event-driven architecture or in, and so on. So normally we, um, those, we can connect to those topics, whether it's Kafka or something else, and then immediately start ingesting with very low latency. So we, we uh, you know, without uh, uh, any lag, pretty much, there's always a little bit of lag depending on, on you know, and on a, on a number of factors, but sub-second um, uh, latency. And then the moment it hits Tiny Bird, it's being stored in, in, a, in an underlying database that it's um, already designed to scale and withstand production use cases. And then, the moment it's available, the moment it hits the database, you can already be querying it. So um, the, from the moment it, the, we read from the Kafka topic to the moment you can then create an API in Tinybird, expose the result of a query as an API, um, and, and have that consumed is very, very small. I'm talking uh, sub-second here from ingestion to, to query. So, you know, and, and the key thing is that we are, there's no middleman there, you know? Um, the data is being generated, we can ingest it right away, and you'll be querying that same data in the same database um, for, for these analytical use cases. And, and, you don't, and in our case, it's managed connectors, so you don't have to manage your own connector. You can also use our API to just send events to us if you want, and uh, that's also super convenient for um, if you want to integrate your application to just send or instrument your application to just send events to us, things like that. Um, but uh, we, in, especially in large companies, we see some kind of streaming infrastructure. Uh, I always use Kafka, but it could be Kinesis or it could be PubSub or it could be something else. And we can connect to that and constantly, automatically uh, bring data. And then we can do things like materialize um, aggregations and joins and things like that in real time. So at ingestion time. So you don't have to program that materialization like you would do with views and, and other types of databases. It literally is doing, the ingestion triggers the materialization. So let's say you wanted to build a chart or like a time series chart. Uh, you can have that, those buckets, let's say, uh, aggregated at ingestion time. So when you query it, you're only ingesting the, re you're only querying the, the result already. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, um, and, and it's always up to date, basically. That's so, cool. Yeah. That enables us to scale to massive amounts of queries as well. And, and so. So then, um, I mean, one of my other questions is the, this does kind of all lead to, um, data literacy, right? Because it, even if you have the technologists who are learning how to do it faster and they, they're the ones who came at some point, it's not going to be valuable if the business keeps responding to it at the pace and rate that they did the old stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So have you seen clients sort of start to get their arms around how, like maybe the technology team starts, but we have to start to pull our business 
in and get closer to it? What does that look like and feel like? Um, I think normally we see the opposite. We or the companies we've worked with are generally digital natives uh, or um, very advanced uh, corporates, very competitive corporates, and so there's a lot of pressure. There's huge objectives on the business side. So uh, and uh, little technologies sort of uh, coming behind, um, and then in some cases, some um, uh, startups we've worked with, they've been able to demonstrate, hey, this is possible with uh, Tiny Bird. And and for instance, we've had a few instances where some problem they've been wanting to tackle for for a while in an internal um, uh, hackathon in the company, some developer using Tiny Bird has come in and said, look, you know, in real time, you know, so just for the hackathon in 24 hours or whatever. So that, that those things we've seen, but generally the pressure we see it coming more from business and, hey, we want to do these things than, uh, than the opposite. That makes sense. Because in those um, industries, when there is this sort of streaming data, they're already used to this. They're, they're, they know speed matters. They're not trying to figure That's out if true. speed matters. So they're chasing it down to see they're finally satisfied with pace. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And so they're just thrilled that they have the answers at the pace that the business needs them when they feel like they haven't maybe in the past. Is that right? That's right. That's exactly okay. right. Okay. What about a, um, I don't know, what about a company like mid, I'm thinking about a mid-sized company who hasn't figured out yet what role speed might play in their business. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm. they're they're sort of not quite as sophisticated or mature in chasing that down. Do you have any thoughts or advice for a a business that hasn't quite contemplated that yet fully and and maybe reasons or use cases for a near real time, you know, data, um, in their, Mm -hmm. in their solutions? Mm. Um, I think the way to think about this is that you um, we've heard a lot of times, I don't need real time for my use case, you know, but actually don't, you don't, it doesn't, um, you know, real time is revenue is not cost. Uh, it used to be cost because doing things in real time used to be very, very expensive, but it isn't anymore. And, um, what you need to be thinking is, um, what that speed wins, you know, that the compound effect of being able to do things faster is huge. And if you can make decisions faster, it means you can make more mistakes faster and iterate faster and come to the right solution faster. And if you can, uh, if your queries take, um, let's say that all your queries take one second, which for us is very slow, but let's say all your queries take one second. Um, if you need to run 10 queries per second, then you need at least 10 CPUs to uh, run those queries. If you need to run a thousand queries per second, then you need a thousand CPUs to be able to scale to that. Let's say that your queries take a hundred milliseconds, then you need 10 times the amount of CPUs to run 1000 queries per second. So that's money. That's mm, uh, money that you can dedicate to other infrastructure or to other projects or to hire more developers or, or whatever. So um, whether, you know, being able to make decisions faster, to react faster, to spend less in infrastructure, also in terms of development, like one of the things that we see is development speed. Like if your queries, if you, as opposed to using something like Spark, where a query will take maybe a few minutes, you know, if your query takes a couple of seconds, what effect does that have for developers in order to build things, to put them in production? They'll be, they, they won't run a query and go get a coffee. They'll run a query and then make whatever change they need, just put it in production, you know? So those, all of those things added up and thinking about speed and, and how, you know, and embracing speed as a way of working is what drives, you know, being the uh, market leader, you know? If, if you look at market leaders, any in any uh, vertical, um, they'll probably be fast movers, uh, very likely, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I like, I like the idea too, as, as we are, you know, definitely hearing, as you mentioned earlier, um, questions about how do we get, how does, how do IT teams get more efficient? How do we make sure that we're driving the most value out of their time? And, you know, we're looking at a whole bunch of companies are probably looking at their budgets for next year already. Right. And they're looking at 
you know, do we need more developers? Do we need more? Is, is our infrastructure cost going up? What's going to change about next year? The ability to understand that this can actually drive efficiencies in um, in your technology spend and how you leverage it more successfully or thoughtfully. Um, that makes a ton of sense to me. And I, I just love this phrase you used. You talked about um, turning your data into revenue. I just, yeah. I, I love it. And I think that there are, in my experience, there are people that 100% understand that con- concept and 100% don't. I don't know many people in the middle. Like either you get it and you yeah. understand that your data is revenue and, or, it's, or it's potential revenue you're not realizing. Um, yeah. And if you can look at it that way, you'll get way more incentivized about speed and accuracy, et cetera. Absolutely. Do you, does that make, okay. That's, that's absolutely. cool. That's absolutely. awesome. <laughs> we we uh we this is this is what we um see in the best companies we work with we they understand that and they take that to the limit um and uh and they don't wait they don't waste time i mean probably the uh the worst companies uh in terms of data are those that are buried in data and they don't know what to make the best of it. And the best companies is they're very focused on what are the things that make the difference to us? What is really important to the business? Let's make sure that's fast, it's available, it's consistent to everyone in the company so that everyone's looking at the same data and they can make decisions over um, that data uh, and, and it, it, as soon as it's available. Yeah, I love... Um... Man, I really, I think you've, de- you've defined data-driven leadership in that comment there, that you appreciate the data as an asset and you want it to be quick and available for everyone who needs it to make the right decisions. I mean, I think that that yeah. is, okay, so then, then I have to round you out as a person because we've talked about speed so much that mm-hmm. it can almost sound, right, like it's like uh, we're machines. And so um, I've, I've also heard that you have a pretty good you know, uh, Jorge himself has a pretty, pretty good principle around like work-life balance or an ability to be, be present where you are. Um, and so, so when we talk about speed all the time at work, how do you juggle that with also being human <laughs> and being, yeah. you know, s- uh, somebody who's well-balanced? What's your take there? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the, that's a great, uh, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, actually, if you look at Tiny Bird, this is not a company where people work to the death until the late hours of the uh, evening or whatever, but we're pretty intense while we're working in the sense of not wasting time. Like, you know, and uh, and whenever we're thinking, hey, should we do this? Should we do that? We always say, guys, speed wins. You make the decision because it's probably like 80% of the decisions are reversible and, uh, you know, it's better to make a decision, just keep moving. And then, you know, and then some things require more time. And then even myself, I'm, I'm not a young kid anymore. I can't work those many hours. I have kids of my own. Um, so we, you know, as much as possible, um, we, we, I try to balance uh, work life and I, you know, during the weekends, I stay away from Slack and I stay away as much as I can. And, uh, you know, we ask people to be flexible uh, the same way we allow them to have flexibility in their work hours because starting a business, it's not, you know, it's complicated and you have customers and they have needs and, and you have to be there for them. Uh, but, you know, we're, we, um, we take that very seriously as well. We see this as a marathon. We want to be in top shape 10 years from now. You know, we, we don't want to uh, die in the process just because we're all so exhausted that it doesn't make any sense, you know? So, um, so yeah. I respect it's, that. Yeah, but it's, it's difficult. And I, I'm, I don't, I would lie if uh, I would tell you, if I tell you that I'm getting it right 100% of the time, you know, <laughs> and my most, even though I stay out of way from Slack and all these things, my biggest problem is, you know, how do I actually disconnect? You know, how do I close the uh, laptop and actually say, hey, now I'm going to be present for my family and I'm going to be present for, you know, that's to me the, the hardest things. And, and the things that help me on a personal level is, um, uh, exercise, you know, just going for a run or, you know, cycling or, or doing some exercise 
and uh, and then you know just um, spending time with the family and and listen to them and then put them first in the weekend. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds like a healthy balance for me. I, I think in I think I certainly am on a recovering side of. 2,900, 3,000 hour years. Um, and so it got to a point where, you know, I have two small kids too. And it was like, Hey, this isn't, um, I don't know. I had, I had some life hit me in the face a couple of years ago. And I just realized, um, somebody said to me, you're, you're, um, you're living your life like a video game. And at the end you get a prize. And they're like, you're missing that. This is it. This is the price. You have to enjoy that. this. Um, that doesn't mean you work less hard, but it does mean, and I like your sense of when I'm working, let's work, let's get some stuff done and speed does yeah. matter. And let's trust each other and make decisions. And most of them are reversible. I think that that's right. Um, yeah. but I always, I use the phrase like be where my feet are. Like if I'm at work, let's be at work. If I'm at home, let's yeah. be at home. Um, and I also get that right. Not a hundred percent of this. <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes us good people that we get to practice. It's like a, it's like yoga. You have a practice. We're practicing being present, right? Yeah. Well, Jorge, is there, before we go, is there anything else I haven't asked you about that I really should, or we need to make sure we cover? Um, not really. Uh, just that, uh, you know, um, Tiny Bird is, is, uh, is free to try and, uh, we're have a Slack community. I'm, I'm there. My co-founders are there. I would love to, uh, uh, get people to use Tiny Bird and give us feedback and, uh, and yeah, um, that's really it. It's been, it's been great to talk to you. You too. And Hey, if people want to follow you or find you, where mm -hmm. can they find you? Uh, uh, we're, um, well, tinybird is tinybird.co, uh, the, the, um, the domain tinybird.co on Twitter. Um, and I'm, uh, Jorge Sancha in Twitter as well. I don't tweet much these days. I must say, I, I'm trying to stay. One of the things that I'm trying to do to make better use of my time is not spend a lot of time in, in social media, but, uh, but yeah, the two places where I post something sometimes uh, is on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been great uh, meeting you and uh, enjoyed the conversation very much. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jess Carter. Don't forget to follow the Data Driven Leadership wherever you get your podcast and rate and review letting us know how these data topics are transforming your business. We can't wait for you to join us on the next episode.